Hello everybody, this is Mark Basher with Go Engineer, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar where we will be highlighting Stratasys' new flexible TPU material, FDM TPU 92A. For anyone who doesn't know about Go Engineer, for the last 30 years we have purveyed and fully supported what we truly believe are the best engineering tools in the marketplace, helping our customers bring the absolute best products to market with minimal risk, cost, and wasted time. I think it makes sense to get things started with a little bit of background on what exactly is TPU. TPU is an acronym that stands for thermoplastic polyurethane. TPUs have been widely used in lots of different industries since their emergence in about the 1950s. And one of the primary industries to uh, start using them are uh, automotive. Also used today commonly in power tools, household appliances, sporting goods, medical devices, inflatables, drive belts, footwear, weather stripping, bushings, gaskets, grommets, couplers, cable sheathings, and a whole bunch of different automation products like grippers and grabbers and suction cups. Um, a lot of the flexible things that we see in everyday products, good chance if they're not silicone, they're most likely a, uh, a TPU or some variant of that. What's interesting about TPU, why there's such a high demand to prototype them, is that uh, you know they're used with a lot of different manufacturing processes. As injection molding, they're used uh, both directly in molded and as over-molded on rigid plastic parts. And TPUs can also be extruded, uh, put into sheets and films, done with blow molding, rotomolding, and thermoforming process. A lot of different ways to use TPU to create uh, desired geometries. The reason TPUs are so prolific is they have some really desirable properties. They have a really high elasticity, they're good at absorbing energy and like impact type things. And we can color them and, and use them on like uh, sunglasses where we can get, you know, virtually every color under the sun in the finished product. They resist oils and greases and abrasion, and they have a high friction coefficient, which makes them you know, kind of tacky and non-slip. Uh, they're also non-marring and they won't scratch or damage things that they do happen to come in contact with. Really, there's such a big market, I think, for this material because current elastomer prototyping options are really, for many different reasons, not ideal. Typical with, uh, you know, we can do traditional manufacturing to prototype something, but that requires the tooling to do, which can be thousands of dollars and weeks of lead time before we can produce those molds and, you know, maybe do some silicone molding or RTV molding or LSR molding or something like that. So. Traditional limitations on actually producing those first articles exist. Secondly, we have a lot of non-FDM additive manufacturing technologies that can produce elastomers. SLS, CLIP, PolyJet, MJP, they all have varieties of elastomers, but as we really start to look at their properties, I think uh, what you find is that they all leave more to be desired, whether it's they don't have the tear strength, they don't have the resilience, they don't have the, the temperature resistance. There's Lots of different reasons that current AM technologies for elastomers just aren't up to the needs of industry. Lastly, there's the hobbyist grade FFF type systems that are able to extrude this material. Although anybody who's really been around this uh, a lot knows, as I commonly say, these are great machines if your time is not particularly valuable. If you're trying to keep an intern busy, they're great low cost machines. But as we look at how an engineer uses their time, typically, it's tough to invest that much time and energy into getting the parts. And, and we can look at some of the greater differences as we're going to go through this. But really what this niche is creative, I was imagine a, an elastomer prototyping solution that delivers the ability to do quick turnaround, relatively large build size, complex geometries, even unmoldable geometries, is reliable to the extent that Stratasys FDM is a very reliable process cost effective and the big common thread you'll see with all Stratasys products is really easy to use. Um, no dedicated operators, hand finishing, anything like that. So I introduce to you the new TPU 92A on the Stratasys F123 series printer. Here we see an example of typical what you might expect like a coupler or a duct or something of that nature and a side-by-side -side video of, uh, of someone actually really twisting and torquing and, uh, and moving on those parts there. So you'll notice it is extremely flexible, extremely resilient, extremely durable, all of the, the qualities that we really want in a uh, solution that allows us to prototype TPU part. 
Um, so looking at the types of things that this particular variant of TPU is good for, it's complex geometries, exceptionally resilient with high elongation, uh, upwards of 500% elongation to break. That means a five inch specimen could in theory stretch to 25 inches before breaking, which is quite impressive. It's consistent, reliable accuracy, all of the qualities typically associated with uh, Stratasys FDM. And we can do large and complex geometries, things that very realistically could not even mold it by traditional means. Some of the other benefits of this new TPU material is uh, the soluble support associated with most of Stratasys FDM material. And really because that support dissolves away, it really it lowers the overall production cost of these printed things by about 1.8 times as compared to non-soluble supported uh, versions where we're breaking the supports off by hand, cutting them away, and ultimately it's ruining our surface finish. And uh, we can build large elastomer parts and the parts that you need, your geometry, not just something the machine can produce. Um, so some of the top user applications that we've seen so far and since this material was launched, I believe it was November 13th at the uh, Form Next show in Europe. So this is brand new stuff just hitting the streets uh, in the last few weeks here. So top user applications, hoses, couplers, air ducts, soft touch and overmold type products, console liners, cup holders, seals, gaskets, grommets, grips, surface protection covers, uh, different bellows, door, window trim, seals, body can panels, and gap hiders. You will notice that seems to be a lot of automotive applications here. I think Stratus is partnered with uh, a couple large Detroit-based automotive OEMs to beta this product and really understand how and where it uh, it provides the most value. And so jumping to that, we'll see a quote from one beta customer that is, build quality was much better than elastomers on alternate FDM and FFF platforms. Build success rate was also 100%. The parts printed right the first time. Here we just see come some kind of examples of the types of applications that this uh, beta customer identified as great, excellent fits for this material. And we see couplers on air intake systems, um, different hoses for heater cores and checking plumbing of, of soft rubber hoses, the soft touch interior items, cup holders, tray liners, etc. The actual grip element of like an emergency brake type pedal or different ducts and, and all that around the engine as well. A lot of different automotive applications. And sticking with that theme, I'm just going to read off a few more beta customer quotes. The parts are virtually indestructible. And as I'm standing here holding one, it's quite impressive that uh, I can, you know, lean into these things and start stretching and pulling with all my might. And I can't separate what's probably... Uh, you know, 80, maybe 100 thousands walled part. So a uh, very, very great layer adhesion, strong, durable stuff. Another quote, everyone is excited about this material, especially in the manufacturing groups. So uh, one thing I see is a lot of different applications as we're looking at automating everything because uh, the cost of labor is so insane these days. And we need to grab, grip, move, orient different parts throughout their automated processes and nothing better to move, grip, and orient the part without damaging it than some sort of a soft grabber or a suction cup that's tuned to, to fit a custom geometry. Moving through the list, used, uh, used to have to find workarounds for elastomer parts. Now we can design for it. Uh, another one, we didn't know how badly we needed this material until we started using it. I think that one's really uh, telling of what the capabilities are here. Being able to print parts quick and easy in-house, our customers are very impressed with our new capabilities. And lastly, the best elastomer I have experienced. And here we see that we're going to talk about the fact that this is only released on the Stratasys F123 series line. Um, this is Stratasys's wildly famous uh, desktop printer variety, I'm kind of the replacement to the, the dimension line of printers if you've been following Stratasys for many years. With this platform, there's a high focus on usability, reliability, and affordability. Um, the materials are cheaper than on other platforms, office friendly, it's quiet, and kind of a, just a real workhorse for your design lab and, and your office space. It's got really good accuracy, detail, repeatability compared to uh, the systems that it obsoleted, i.e. the Dimension and U-Prints, and even those were excellent machines at that. So kind of an ode to how awesome this new platform is. And it builds bigger, faster, and stronger parts than ever before on the series. So if we look at Stratasys' whole system lineup for what they have on FDM today, um, it kind of falls right in the middle. The F123 is below what we call the big boxes that really get us into the high temp, the nylons, and uh, semi-crystalline materials. 
but it's and it's above you know the mojo and the uprint which are the very very entry level single material systems one thing i want to start looking at to really establish how this compares to existing rp elastomers is uh, by looking at this competitive study that stratus has put together basically they selected three different uh, geometries what they'd call a low complexity part a medium complexity part and a high complexity part and they analyzed these three geometries in running in the uh, across the array of different systems that we're about to see and really did a head-to-head -head analysis on what do the materials cost, how labor intensive is the processing, and uh, kind of do a head-to-head -head stack up on that. In this head-to-head -head comparison, they compared the, the carbon systems, the, the DLS systems, a couple different SLS systems, uh, the EOS, and uh, three different FFF or a hobbyist level FDM type system that are capable of printing a Ninja Flex or something like that. And what they compared was material costs, labor costs, total costs of producing a part, and then the equipment, uh, the equipment costs as well. If we look at the material costs alone, and I think this is where a lot of people maybe can get confused or misdirected in that, you know, the Stratasys material, nobody will ever tell you that it's cheap material. Um, Stratasys does a lot of work in maintaining production quality and owning responsibility for the hardware, the material, the software, the process. And all of that means that they have to charge a little bit more for, um, you know, really the robustness and the reliability that, that they're offering. As we're going to see in the subsequent slides, if we look at just the material costs, that's not the whole story on costs. And if we factor in the full picture, what we're going to find is that uh, Stratasys is actually cheaper in where a lot of these savings come from is labor costs. If we look at how much labor it takes to get something out and we apply an average hourly cost rate to the amount of hands-on labor it takes to execute printing on all of these other systems, we'll suddenly realize that the Stratasys F123 labor costs are far below everything else out there. This is truly the Showtime rotisserie oven of 3D printers. Set it and forget it. You know, kick the job off before you go out the door for the afternoon, and you have yourself a uh, a finished part. You know, sitting in the machine in the morning that's just ready to be dropped into a tank where the supports and, and the solutions will do their work to dissolve the supports away. All of these other processes are going to require a lot more setup, a lot more care to facilities and resetting things to get the next job off and especially in the case of the maker level systems a lot of labor in just clipping and trimming off the different support structures that are required to move through the build um, so if we tally up the total part costs with labor and materials together what you see is that really the f123 series for these three parts produces the you know on average the lowest result in terms of total part cost about 39 percent lower on average than the other three so really the F123 does, it's going to win on equipment costs over time as well, where an F123 system is about one-sixth the price of your typical SLS machine and one-eighth the price of a, you know, a standard maybe lease period over a, like a carbon type system. We're going to see that, you know, the F123 series systems on a cost per year basis are very, very low and, you know, approaching, you know, for if we're going to get, you know, for example, on a 170, maybe we get... Uh, five to 10 years off of a machine that's in the $20,000 range, our cost per year is really only in the 5,000, 4,000, the few thousands range. And we're almost approaching what may be a maker level system. And if you've had much experience with the maker level system, you might realize that sometimes it's just better to replace those types of things every year because as things start to wear, um, there's no service agreement, there's no service support, and the person running it tends to be the service guy as well. And after he's wasting, you know, hours and hours out of each week keeping the printer going, it just makes more sense to get a brand new one right from the factory. Um, looking at the uh, material properties for this material, we're just going to stack up the couple different carbon materials, a couple different SLS materials, and sort of look at them side by side. Comparing the, the main characteristic in terms of how this material behaves, we can kind of look at the shore A hardness level. Um, this represents how um, stiff the flexible matrix is. What they do is push a known geometry, sort of a ball type uh, structure into a specimen with a known force. And depending on how far it sinks in, that gives them a, uh, an assessment of the shore A value. We see we're on the stiffer end of things, which is actually good for a lot of different products. The elongation of break with this material, if you look at that, we're at 500%, where 
all of the other materials are, you know, at best uh, 350, but on average, you know, in maybe the, the 200s range. And this is even way better than if you are familiar with Stratasys Polyjet, the elastomer there. The new Agilis material is, if I recall correctly, around 200% elongation to break. We're far superior to even the previous Stratasys Polyjet elastomer solution. I'm looking at tensile strength, we're, we're almost double what the nearest competitor might be. Tear strength off the chart here, where we see the 130s, 110s, 140 and we're at 480. So this is very, very tear resistant. And like I mentioned earlier, as I'm pulling on the part I have right in front of me, I just can't tear it or pull it apart by hand. I need to go get my clippers and cutters to, uh, to really take this thing apart. So how do you get started printing it? First, I want to address anyone who would be an existing F123 customer. Um, it's pretty straightforward, and all they need to do is purchase what's called the elastomer extrusion kit. This kit comes with the custom elastomer extrusion head, which uh, will be visually obvious because it is now blue, where the, instead of the black and the gray, like the traditional extruder and the PLA extruder. It'll come with a spool of the material, two upper Y blocks, and we'll talk about uh, what those do and how they're installed later. A brochure with all of the installation instructions and a web address to download the uh, best practices document. And this entire kit can be installed by any customer in literally minutes uh, out in the field. No service visit required, order the startup kit and, uh, and you're live. So options for new system customers of the F123 series. If you purchase a new F170 or 270, you will, just like an existing user, you would need to purchase the elastomer extrusion kit as an option. However, if you buy the 370, what they've done is now included the new elastomer extrusion kit in lieu of the PLA extrusion kit that used to come with the machine. So um, if you were thinking about buying the F370 before today, then you decide to buy it today, you will get that as a, a totally free upgrade to the purchase that you were already considering. So just looking at the extrusion heads on the F123 series, there are three of them. And the standard black one is associated with the ABS, ASA, PCABS, if you have a 370 that can print the PCABS and the support material. And there's the gray extrusion head for the PLA, and there is the blue extrusion head uh, for the new TPU-92A material. The lifetime and warranty information on these heads is... Average customer head life is expected to be around 800 hours compared to 1,500 hours for the rigid material head. So roughly half the life of the heads that you might be using to extrude, you know, ABS, PCABS, ASA. The elastomer print head is a little bit lower than for rigid materials. Yeah, so it should last about a year was what they're sus suspecting for most average customers. That many customers may choose to just have a dedicated elastomer printer and I'll talk a little bit about more that why that is uh, in a second. Warranty on this head is basically three months after your first use. So when you install this head to your machine, your machine configuration file recognizes that, hey, this is a brand new elastomer head and the clock starts ticking. And if you have any issues in the first three months of that, Stratasys will just uh, RMA that and replace it under warranty. And that's the same as the rigid heads for the standard F123 materials. If you already have an F123 system, let's talk about some of the best practices for running this material. Um, so the new TPU-92A comes on the same filament spools as the traditional rigid materials. The filament tail clips to the spool outside diameter to kind of stop it from unwinding in transit. Only thing you need to do is peel off the little orange tape and load it just like you would any other material. You will notice this material loads much slower than the other materials. It, it takes about a minute instead of about 10 seconds. And the reason is it's not always uh, easy to push a chain, so you got to do it real slow to stop it from uh, binding in the system. Secondly, because of the way the, the material actually pushes to the, when it's unloading, it can't what we call swallow the tail or you know push the material back through the filament detect switch. So what ends up happening is we get some extra material kind of stranded in the tube and we have to manually pull that out. So we can cut that off. There's an extra 50 to 100 feet, including on that after it's physically marked empty by the chip. Also too, if you think about this, we're really kind of a moving target, right? I mean, we're, we, the filament is flexible. So how long is it really at a 500% elongation to break, right? I mean, in theory, I should be able to take a, uh, 10 foot section of filament and stretch it out to uh, to 50 feet in and of itself without breaking it. 
Material handling on this TPU, proper storage is really critical with this. When we move the spools, we want to place them in, in mylar bags immediately after. And the reason for that is so they don't absorb moisture from the atmosphere. That moisture, when we go to extrude it, turns into steam, causes a loss of control over the extrusion process and poor quality to result. And the idea with this is if we're going to be you know, leaving the machine idle for periods greater than 48 hours, we want to actually unload the material and go ahead and bag it up just to be safe. If we're in a really humid environment, I'm thinking for anyone who's maybe in uh, South Texas or, you know, Louisiana or somewhere like that, definitely make sure that we reduce it as much as possible. They say 36 hours for sufficiently humid environments. If we do let it sit idle for more than 48 hours, then the idea is unload, cut off six feet, and then reload to the printer so we make sure we're getting started with only dry material. Build tray handling, and this is really maybe not unique to the new TPU, but just kind of a uh, F123 platform thing in general, is we don't want to touch the trays anywhere with our hands. The reason is our hands have oils. The oils tend to gravitate towards the rough texture on the tray and ultimately prevent good adhesion of the workpiece to the tray. Once that happens, we can have some part quality issues or some parts that become dislodged from the tray mid-build and not get the great part that we're desiring. The part accuracy for this, what they say for this is plus or minus 10 thousandths or plus or minus 3 thousandths inch per inch, whichever is greater. I, I'm recognizing my error there where I put plus or minus zero inch per inch. That should be three. For a one inch feature, expect that to be within 10 thou. For a 10 inch feature, let's expect that to be plus or minus 30 thou. The achievable accuracy specification was derived from statistical data at 95% dimensional yield. One thing to note is that Z part accuracy, we're going to tack on an additional slice height thickness to that. And that's because the material tends to rise up on that top layer a little bit and maybe come above the trailing edge of the support tip. So it can add a little bit more to that in Z. Putting the parts in the support removal tank may cause swelling. So if we're leaving a part to soak overnight or for an extended a period of time, We'd expect that to swell by about a half a percent, but if we usually just let it sit out and dry for a couple few days after that, it should shrink back the original intended size. But due to the nature of this elastomer material and the fact that it is really, really tough stuff, you know, to have controlled extrusion, the visual quality of parts, and especially on fine features, is not as good as it is for rigid materials. So I would never steer someone to this material and saying this is a great aesthetic solution. We're really going to use it when functional properties demand it. But talking about the head, the new blue head that's on these systems, um, really Stratus has had to completely change the way that we grab this. I, I mentioned earlier that pushing chain is not always the uh, easiest thing to do. And so they kind of had to come up with an uh, extrusion head that has increased pinch on the material. And then there's actually four different drive gears controlling the extrusion. Kind of mentioned the head life earlier. They say 800 is the typical um, the way it works is at 700 hours, the user will be notified, hey, you should think about ordering a new head. At 800, it will say, hey, you should go ahead and replace this. But if the quality is satisfactory, you can override that and you can continue using it until, you know, quality falls below whatever standard you have. And you go ahead and swap that new head you order right in and keep running. Again, the warranty is 90 days from the date that it's first installed to the machine. And the machine recognizes, hey, I've got a new head in here. Throughput on this, it's not quite as fast as the ABS and ASA, and expect to see about 50% slower throughput than on those materials. The upgrade kit, if we're going to be running this, and uh, just so you know, all new systems are actually shipping with this new modified upper Y block, so disregard this if you are about to order a system or have ordered a system in the last couple weeks. But basically, the top cap on the Y block, what they recognize is there's a need to media blast the interior to change the friction coefficient and stop any loading issues. So they send those along in the TPU startup kit and on new machines. And really, it's a quick 30 second process to pop those in and, and get things started. So a little bit different approach to calibration. If you're familiar with doing the tip offset calibration on rigid material is measuring the thickness of the support itself. On this, that doesn't exactly work. So what the procedure is to just use, we do the auto tip offset calibration first, which does the automatic Z offset. Then we proceed to the manual tip offset procedure to dial in X and Y. 
The TPU adheres extremely well to the QSR. So that's another thing that makes it difficult to peel the strip off and measure it. The manual Z is really not applicable for that material. If you do come across any part surface issues, ripples, waves, you kind of see an example there. Um, step one, make sure our tips are clean and free of any materials or debris. Clean if we uh, notice any of that. Additionally, we're going to check our tip wipes, make sure they're engaging properly with the edges of the tips and getting a clean wipe as we're purging each time. And if we're uncertain of maybe that canister has been loaded and not used for a long period of time, I would recommend trying a brand new canister of material and make sure that it's not moisture. And lastly, sometimes we're just limited, whether it's a thin wall or a certain type of feature, we can always try different orientations to fix any undesirable surface conditions. Support removal, again, this is an entirely soluble support. Can't really do it by hand because it bonds so well, you're likely to damage the part if you do try to remove it by hand. 70C is the recommended temperature. We do note that the ultrasonic tanks are recommended, especially if we're doing like tubes and ducts that have you know, deep uh, blind holes or things going back down. The ultrasonics tend to um, really increase the diffusion and, and the soluble front oh, as opposed to the um, traditional circulation tanks. So for example, the, the default tank, if you have an F123 series, is the SCA 1200 or 3600, and those are circulation-based. So if you want, we have a whole line of different uh, ultrasonic tanks that we represent and could get you information on. So you could look up any temperature controllable ultrasonic tank on the market and get that as an addition. Uh, moving on, some different considerations. Part orientation. This material is unique where normally we're orienting parts for function, aesthetic, speed, maybe to minimize support or increase surface finish. And we really don't put a lot of thought in orientation in terms of does the orientation affect whether or not this is successful. And with the FDM TPU 92A, that's a little bit different where we always want to think about success and stability for the build. I'm sure you can imagine if you have a really sufficiently tall feature, which uh, you'll probably see in the next slide. You know, as we're trying to deposit on that, it's flexible material, so it has a tendency to wiggle and move around, and that's not an ideal condition. Um, be thinking about that, and this is what I was referring to when I mentioned the picture on the next slide, where if we had this little 90-degree elbow-type piece, we would want to do one of the two orientations on the right, because once we get off of the support base here and continue building up on this uh, completely vertical feature, the workpiece is going to wiggle and shake around, and uh, that's going to produce a bad surface finish result. Additionally, if you are running on the F370 platform, you have the option of using the Insight software. And if you have access to that, you can use that to create what are called stabilizer walls. And we can also adjust the self-supporting angle to trigger supports to generate where they otherwise wouldn't as a default. Um, just so you guys know, the default self-support angle is at 55 degrees on the systems built into the software. So if we're green flagging an Insight or we're using GrabCAD print, Anything flatter than 55 degrees underneath will get supports on it. So if you have access to Insight, aka if you have an F370, here we kind of see the initial model or setup. The only infill style available as a default is the high density. That equates to about 80% infill for sufficiently large features. The default visible surface style is enhanced. All the traditional solid, sparse double dense, sparse low density are, are just not available. Um, they recommend um, really you don't want to try to go above that 80% because that opens up the opportunity for head jams if we're trying to squeeze too much material into too tight of an area. Um, so some of the default support parameter setup items. So the default is smart support. You don't know SMART is an acronym for save material and runtime. Although we have the additional options of sparse and surround. Um, for this, I think surround is important because, again, I mentioned earlier the, the wiggly workpiece. If it's not supported well, it moves, and that causes all kinds of surface finish problems. And the surround support will add kind of a rigid backbone to the workpiece mid-print and really help us get the best result and help everything stay fixed during the building process. Things to note that if you look at the part, the layers where it's actually touching support might have a little bit of a matte finish, and the things you know that are upward facing or not in support will tend to be a little bit more glossy. So it's probably fairly subtle, but if you look closely, you can definitely see that. So by that same token, surround supports can leave lines and blemishes on the part, but we don't want to use model as support on this. And the reason we don't want to use model as support, again, is the support is really our backbone for stability in the build. And we use model as support like we might, you know, be inclined to do with 
other FDM materials. And we lose the rigidity and the stability during the build, and then our quality and surface finish can fall off. Setting up the tool paths and insight, we have, you know, the default part fill is multiple contours and they are linked, which means they kind of spiral inside of each other. And really what that does is help with sealing. Uh, those concentric tool paths do better to, you know, allow our seam to not introduce more porosity. Um, again, the, the linked contours and multiple help mitigate the porosity created at that seam location. The number of contours can be increased or decreased. One thing that's been you know, noted is that if we're building really thin wall parts, instead of running fatter contours that fill with a single, we recommend doing thinner contours and doing multiple of them so they, uh, they link up and, and seal nicely. Part stabilization. So one thing to note if we're using Insight to stabilize the part, Insight has a wall called Wall Stabilize where we can pick walls and then it automatically generates structures that kind of uh, act as a support to that. By default, they are made out of the model material. I've already sort of mentioned this, but we're really looking for a rigid support, not a flexible support. So the idea is once we create these, we want to you know, use the wall stabilize as the custom group template. And if you're familiar with custom groups, because you've been through the training, you hit that template, you'll find the wall stabilize. It'll pull in all these parameters, and we just want to invert the material from the default model to support, which makes it come out of the soluble support material that's rigid instead of the model and give some really good backbone to help stabilize the part. The last item I want to talk about is the sacrificial and purge towers. We recommend a full height one for every build. This enables faster model to support head swaps. So there's some time associated with ramping up temperature and, and doing a little purge and getting to the right um, control of extrusion before moving to the workpiece. And if we do that right next to the workpiece, it uh, happens a lot quicker than if we have to go all the way over to the purge bucket. And it also is right where we want it, not falling into a purge bucket where it can become dislodged and, ro and go rogue on us and you know end up lodged in our part in a place where we don't want it. Um, so the best practice is to place it next to the first part in the pack or the tallest part in the pack. So that's most of the information. Um, if you're still with me here, I'm gonna jump through some of the uh, FAQs, so the common FAQs with this. Um, also feel free to submit any questions that you have through this and I will address those once I get through this specific list. I um, mean, a lot of these, I think maybe we, uh, we've already addressed along the way, but just to recap, if I buy a new F123, is the elastomer kit included or is it extra? So the idea is for 370 purchases, yes, it is included. For 170 and 270 purchase, you will have to order it as a separate line item or an option. Can the customers install the TPU kit themselves? Yes, the installation is quick and easy. So it's very straightforward and that when you buy the kit, it comes with the instructions right in there. Will the TPU be available in other slice heights besides the 10 that we have now? The plan is yes, there's no firm date on it, but uh, Stratasys anticipates having a uh, seven slice available at a later date once they've done all of the tuning and testing and validating for that. And for anyone who doesn't know, Stratasys has probably the most rigorous process in the industry for making sure that, you know, when they sell a capability, when they offer it to the customer, they make sure it's very robust, very controlled, very useful. And if it's not that, they'll go back to the drawing board and keep tuning and tweaking and working on it until it is ready for that. So um, just a, a lot of R&D and testing, and I'm sure it'll be uh, just a matter of time. When will the F370 printers begin shipping with the kit? Any orders after November 13th, which was when they officially announced the, uh, the this new material. Other colors available. So right now, uh, semi-translucent is on the roadmap. No firm date yet on that, but definitely expect to see that at, uh, at some point in the near future. And, you know, if there was a business case for colors and somebody was willing to split the cost, I would imagine you could even uh, pinch them for some colored materials at some point in the future as well. People often ask, it's a big question, why are elastomers not on the Fortis line? Well, the, the canned answer that Stratasys obviously has is putting the material on the Fortis line will require hardware changers and R&D resources. And instead, they wanted to invest it on a platform that was readily available at a lower cost point. And that's true. And I also think that you know, knowing that this needed an entirely different head design, Stratasys, if you had a 450, you know, 380, whatever, uh, the bigger box systems and you wanted to run this, you would need to get a whole new head. And additionally, on those platforms, materials are generally sold as an additional license fee. So if we had to buy a new head and you had to buy the license, 
at that price point, you could just bring in a whole separate F-170 dedicated to the TPU, or you know, you could do the TPU and use it as overflow for any of the ABS, ASA work that you get. The ABS and ASA on that platform is cheaper, so it you know maybe opens up the door to additional cost savings. So I think that was a really a good move on their part to go ahead and focus and put the R&D energy into getting it on this platform first, which really opens it up to a wider range of Stratasys customers. So lastly, we'll talk about some of the available resources. If you want to see some of the more um, you know in-depth material properties that we did not cover today, there's a material properties data sheet that we can get you. Just reach out, email me. I'm sure if you Google it, you can find it that way as well. And there's also a quick start guide for anybody who's getting started with this material. This will ship if you order the kit, but if you want to look that up and really see more in detail of what the kit has, the contents, etc., that is available as well. So with that, I thank you guys for tuning in with me today. I hope uh, I answered any questions and all the uh, things you needed to know about this new material.